San Mateo County Planning Commission meeting of November 13, 2019 will please come to order. Please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Janet, may I have the roll call, please? Commissioner Hansen? Here. Commissioner Ketchum? Here. Commissioner Santa Cruz? Here. Commissioner Gupta? Here. Commissioner Ramirez is absent, and staff is represented by Monowitz and Fox. Uh, before we go to the main agenda items, uh, are there any members of public who would like to address the commission on matters that are not on today's agenda? Do we have any speaker cards, Jan? None. Um, barring none, I would like to close the public hearing. Uh, moving on to consideration of the minutes of the Planning Commission meeting of October 23rd, 2019. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes? So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any who oppose? <coughs> so minutes of October 23rd, 2019 Planning Commission meeting are approved 4 to 0 uh, with Commissioner Ramirez uh, absent. Moving on to our regular agenda item, uh, Janet. Um, may I suggest, Madam Chair, that I make the phone call and let um, Mr. Bixby hear the whole record of the proceeding? Uh, please, go ahead, Steve. Okay. I should have had it programmed in. Hello, Mr. Bixby. This is Steve Monowitz, the Community Development Director for San Mateo County Planning and Building Department. And we are here at the Planning Commission hearing of November uh, 13th, or is it 14th? 13th, thank you, excuse me. And um, we are making special accommodations to enable you to participate by phone. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, I can. Yeah, I, I do appreciate that. Okay, so I'm going to review uh, for you the order of proceedings here. What's going to happen is our Planning Commission Secretary will read the item into the record. The staff will make a presentation. The Planning Commission will ask staff any questions they may have. And then you will have an opportunity to make your comments. And that will be the only time that you should speak unless the commissioners have specific questions of you. Is that understood? Yes, absolutely. Could you say that again, please? Uh, yes, absolutely. Okay. Okay, very good. Um, so, uh, Janeth, will you please go ahead and read the item into the record? Item one, owner, undetermined, applicant, Edward Bixby, File number PLN 2019-00023, location 1165 Verde Road, Unincorporated Half Moon Bay. Our planner is presenting her uh, <clears throat> report here. Uh, it's Renee Ananda, planner with the current planning section, the planning building department. Um, good morning, Chair Gupta and Commissioners. Uh, item number one is planning case PLN 2019-00023. Uh, 
It's an application for a coastal development permit, planned agricultural permit, and use permit to legalize unpermitted development and reestablish a cemetery which is a non-conforming use of the parcel. Slide two um, shows the parcel and the location um, and setting. The proposed project site is a historic Parisima Cemetery located at 1165 Verde Road in unincorporated Half Moon Bay. <coughs> the parcel is outlined in yellow in the aerial photo on slide two. It's within the coastal zone and zoned um, PADCD, which is Planned Agricultural District Coastal Development. Um, the general plan use designation is agricultural rural. Historic Parisima Cemetery was established as a rural cemetery in 1868. It occupies a five-acre parcel, which is mostly flat with, with the south side gently sloping toward the Parisima Creek drainage, uh, which abuts the uh, property on the south. The parcel is vegetated with coastal scrub brush, poison oak, evergreens, and Monterey cypress. Um, it's bordered by Verde Road on the north, an open field with scrub brush on the east, uh, Parisima Creek on the south, and the, uh, and the south, and um, the former Parisima town is located on, it, on its western boundary. Land uses in the surrounding properties include agricultural, open space, and parcels with sin single family homes. Again, slide three shows an aerial of the parcel. Um, this application is for a CDP, PAD, and use permits to reestablish um, use of the historic cemetery and to legalize unpermitted development, including the erection of solid materials for or structures, um, the change in the intensity of the use of the land, and removal or harvesting of major vegetation other than for agricultural purposes. Oh, shit. I want to go back. Yeah, sorry. Um, the application was submitted in response to a county violation case in which an administrative order was issued in October uh, 2018. That order requires the applicant to immediately cease unpermitted development um, and to apply for the required permits for that type of activity. So slide four shows some of the un unpermitted structures on the parcel. Um, basically, solid materials or structures are prohibited under the, um, uh, under the CDP, excuse me, under the LCP. Um, the applicant constructed and installed uh, wooden ramps, seen in the photo on the upper right side, maintenance shed, which is you can see in the bottom slide, and bench and signs, as shown in the upper uh, middle photo. The photo on the far left shows the county's um, notice of violation, which was posted in March of 2018. Um, in this side slide, you can see uh, the removal of vegetation. Uh, the unpermitted burials were con conducted by the applicant. Vegetation was cleared for the burial site shown in the photo on the left. Um, in the photo on the right, you can see where vegetation has been removed um, along the edge um, over the drop off to the uh, Parisima Creek itself. Um, and, and, you know, there's been a change in the intensity of use of the parcel, as mentioned earlier. So in this slide, you can see in the upper left. Um, a, a burial site that was prepared or being prepared for use. Um, the slide below that shows the actual burial um, has been conducted. In the upper right, you see in the historic cemetery, or excuse me, a historic grave site, and directly behind it, you see um, a, a, an unpermitted burial that was um, placed at that location. And the bottom right, you'll see also mark, markers that have been placed to show um, additional burial or future proposed locations.
Um, there is a high potential that vegetation removal, ground disturbance, ceremonial gatherings, and visitations could result or will result in adverse impacts to resources. There's no plan for avoiding impacts to the visual qualities of the Cabrillo Highway Scenic Corridor, important sensitive um, habitat areas, and important natural resources present on the site. The applicant has failed to provide information to demonstrate that the unpermitted and proposed development activities will not lead to erosion of the creek banks or discharge, discharge of sediment or pollutants um, into the watershed. The unplanned and unpermitted removal of vegetation and placement of human remains is inconsistent with the general plan's requirement that public health and safety will be protected. The request to allow additional burials and to retain unpermitted development that advertises and facilitates this use does not comply with general plan policies regarding visual quality, vegetation, water, fish, and wildlife resources. Um, for example, particularly Parisima Creek. Um, it also uh, could impact historical and archaeological uh, resources as well. The request does not conform to specific findings required by the LCP policies with respect to locating and planning development, agriculture, sensitive habitats, and visual resources. The request to legalize the unpermitted development and to continue the unpermitted use does not meet the requirements for issuance of a use permit. Additionally, it does not meet the requirements for a PAD permit. And pursuant to section 15270 of the um, California Environmental Quality Act, which is the projects which are disapproved, um, CEQA does not apply to those projects um, that a public agency rejects or disapproves. So, Staff recommends that the Planning Commission deny the requested CDP, PAD, and use permits. Um, this concludes our presentation, and if you have questions, I'm available. Questions for Thank you. Me? Commissioner Good Hansen. Good morning. Good morning. Um, just some background information for me. So for uh, Skylon Cemetery, th is that also um, agricultural land? I do not know the designation, zoning designation off the top of my head. I do know that um, we have done uh, permit actions and CEQA review of the activities yeah. related to Skyline. So, um, yes, yeah, so they come in front of us all the time and I just, right. at the moment, I can't recall and I can't, for some reason I'm not connecting to the internet so I can't even look it up. I, I should be able to get you that information before the end of this hearing. I'll just, okay. Um, when was this zone for agriculture? Was, I presume this goes way back. Way back. I think it predates our local coastal program, which was certified by the Coastal Commission in around 1982. And at the time, the commission certified our zoning and policies. Um, the PAD had already been long in existence. Okay. Given that it was a historic cemetery, how does one do agriculture? So it's not unusual, um, as this commission is aware, that when we adopt new zoning, we need to be we need to consider um, how that impacts existing uses, and oftentimes what results is what was allowed previously becomes what we call a legal non-conforming use, and so I think you, what your question is getting at is um, if at one time it was a legal use then um, at what point was it abandoned and you could no longer conduct um, burials without a permit? 
Um, I don't have all the answers to those questions, and I think they'll likely come out during the hearing. Mm -hmm. But um, the fact that it is a historical cemetery, I think, gets in the way of it being used for agriculture mm -hmm. um, because um, there's probably um, some requirements to protect existing burials that I'm not familiar with, but we wouldn't force a landowner who had a historic cemetery to conduct agriculture on lands that where you had former burials. Um, the question is, well, what about the areas where burials had not occurred? And under our local coastal program, um, those areas could be potentially cultivated for agricultural purposes um, if there had, were adequate soils and water and so forth. And I don't believe that um, this site contains the type of conditions that would be conducive to an agricultural use. Mm -hmm. um, agriculture is not the only use allowed within the PAD. Um, and so there are potentially other uses that could be conducted on areas outside of the historic burials. Mm -hmm. But any such use or development would require a coastal development permit. So... In yeah, Europe, yeah. while there, I was tr trying there. to tr trace my ancestors, I found out cemeteries can be decommissioned. Okay. You know, usually it's 50 years after the last burial. Do, do we have any de decommissioning in California that we know of? At the moment in California, the act of burying human remains is an intensely regulated uh, um, activity, and I cannot claim to understand the full array of the state regulations that apply. Um, there are entire sections, I think, of the Business and Professions Code and, and possibly the Health and Safety Code as well that apply to mm -hmm. burial practices, but I, I am not familiar with how to go about decommissioning a cemetery. Okay. And like I said, this, when the cemetery was... Uh, I guess the cemetery goes back to the original town of Parisima. And, you know, I can find a map that goes back to about 1854 with the cemetery on it. Um, did anybody own the cemetery? I, I mean, was it just acknowledged that this was a cemetery or was it set out as a cemetery or is it just common use? The answer to those questions are complicated as well. And the question of ownership has been a major factor in terms of us trying to resolve this situation. And the questions regarding ownership remain unresolved at this point. And I can appreciate that. OK, that, that helps me with my background. <clears throat> Questions, Mr. Sanders. I have some, but um, at the very end, the when very I want to hear from the applicant. Um, so, to follow up on Tim's uh, comment about decommissioning, um, maybe we don't know much about that part, but isn't family involved in? Uh, like it's an emotional thing to uh, to decommission a, a grave or whatever you may call it. Right. Um, because of my role in advising the commission, there have been others in the county council's office that have assisted the planning department with regard to some of the enforcement issues that were referenced by Ms. Ananda about um, the uh, the permit violation um, engaging in the activity. <coughs> it's my understanding that the department has consistently uh, taken the position that it, at no point is anybody going to be disinterred as a result of any action by the county. Um, we're not doing like, say, what San Francisco did um, after the earthquake in order to recover a bunch of the land in, in city limits that was in use as cemetery where they actually disinterred people and moved them to Colma. We're not proposing anything like that. It's simply a matter of whether or not a permit is necessary in order to engage in new continuing burial operations on the site. 
um, and the legalization of that uh, going forward. So yeah, we 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 hope not to uh, make this too emotional an issue with regard to the folks that already have settled expectations. Um, once you've buried a loved one, you kind of expect that it stays that way. In, in fact, one of our concerns, which I'm sure you read in the staff report, has to do with the lack of a clear plan about how future burials will occur, how, where, um, and you know, of course, you know, we're concerned about the impact on coastal resources, but concern for existing burials is also, I think, a relevant consideration. So if I can interrupt here. Thank you. Go ahead. So there is no survey of where the bodies really lie? Not that I'm aware, Ms. Ananda. We, um, actually, we consistently asked for a site plan a survey, um, and just October 29th, we received a site plan that shows um, burial locations. Um, I don't know how credible it is, but the applicant finally did submit that. Thank you. So is that the latest we have heard from, latest information we have received from yes. the applicant? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Renee? Thank you, Renee. You're welcome. Um, Madam so Chair, I think now would be an appropriate time to give the applicant his opportunity to speak, if that's okay with you. Uh, yes, I would like to do that. Uh, Shall uh, we give Bixby? him 15 minutes as well, or? Uh, yes. Okay, uh, Mr. Bixby, it will be your turn. We've set the timer for 15 minutes, and um, we'll alert you when that's expired, if you haven't finished by then. Okay, all right, thank you, Steve. Uh, hi, everybody, thank you for the, uh, you know, the arrangements so I could come in by phone. <clears throat> Just to clarify a few things, you know, the, the big... The big problem that has been here is the understanding of cemetery law itself. Uh, you know, the, the cemetery, cemetery law is very clear and distinct and separate from many laws in general. Uh, the cemetery has existed since 1868 as the Prison Cemetery Association. Uh, it was designated as a cemetery. And just as the area uh, that is now known as agriculture uh, existed as agriculture prior to 1982 when the Coastal Development Act came into play. The cemetery has existed since 1868, so that in itself makes it a legal non-conforming use. Now, with that being said, when an entire property is dedicated as a cemetery, that means the entire property is intended for cemetery use itself. It does not matter where one is interred. It just matters that the ground has been dedicated for that. Uh, as I have submitted a plan showing... Uh, burial areas, this cemetery itself has burials throughout the entire parcel, uh, historic and new now. Uh, the intended use has not been changed. Uh, we have not changed. All we have done is cleared out areas so that families could access the historical burial sites. This was a, a clear parcel until 1968 when it was foreclosed upon, on, unfortunately, uh, illegally by the county of San Mateo. Uh, and that was reversed in the 1980s by the state of California, in, and the property was given back to the cemetery, uh, the cemetery Association itself. What I've done is come in and taken the property by notice of adverse possession, uh, reinstituted, you know, the right for the families who own plots there, because people own plots there prior to my management, uh, to be able to inter the dead there again, because they can access these burial sites. So we haven't changed the use. Uh, our access road was removed by the county when they put in a drainage swale. So we put back the ramp and the, uh, the other little ramp. And I did submit an application to the county when I did that. I spoke to the road department. They told me that the uh, walking bridge did not require a permit, but the, the uh, car access one did. I submitted that. I've never heard anything back from that. That's neither here nor there. Uh, the shed was erected on a location that had an existing shed. Uh, this shed is 80 square feet. Uh, as far as, it falls far below the 200 square foot uh, allowance of a shed in San Mateo County without a permit. So, I mean, we gladly removed the shed. Uh, we we want to make a, an amicable solution here, but the thing is the county has kind of overstepped their boundaries when it comes to uh, the quiet, peaceful uh, enjoyment and use of this property as a cemetery, which it was always intended as to be, and it always will be. 
And the one little known thing about cemetery law is that it doesn't matter how much time passes between an internment. It can be 100 years. As long as there's monumentation that can invoke any kind of emotion by any human being for a burial, as long as there are more than six burials, it is forever an, a burial ground. And there is no regulation concerning when you can or cannot use it. So, you know, you, I, I, I have to admit, everyone at the county has been fine. I haven't had any problems with anybody. It's unfortunate that we've had these disagreements. I want things to work out, in particular for the community, because it's a, a historical gem. It's a beautiful place. It's, it's, you know, it's meant to be used by the living. Uh, we have served many great families. Uh, the families who own plots there have come back and just been thrilled to death because they used to have to hack their way to their family plot through all that poison oak, and we've made it accessible again. Uh, we did not use any kind of heavy machinery. We did no grading. We did not remove any vegetation along the Jerusalem Creek bank. I heard that said we did not do that. We did not chop anything down along the bank. Uh, but at any rate, you know, everything was done with rakes and push mowers. If you haven't been there, I, you know, I encourage you to go out and, and enjoy the property. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, they, you know, San Mateo County cannot deny the use of the cemetery, uh, no matter who manages it, whether it's myself or it's somebody else. It doesn't really matter. Uh, the families have their rights, and they have their rights, again, to quiet, peaceful enjoyment of this property. So I would love to have a peaceful, quiet uh setting for my families not to be upset over. I'd love to have a happy relationship with San Mateo County so that you know the residents can come out and enjoy this property. I want to work along with everybody, but at the end of the day, when I started this application, there were certain things that were not uh, given to me concerning wanting to have historical data and uh, concerning like archaeological stuff. And I mean, the cemetery is a cemetery is a cemetery. I mean, we have the locations of where everybody is buried. Uh, we are not impacting the environment in a negative way. Uh, and I, I really don't know what else to say other than that if the application is denied, you know, we'll simply remove the improvements, but it won't change the status of the cemetery. Uh, it will continue to be a cemetery and be, continue to be operated as a cemetery, whether I'm running it or someone else is. Uh, you know, we own six of these facilities across the country, and people, you know, uh, every community that we're involved in absolutely loves what we're doing, and I, and I know that your community members love it too. And uh, I just hope that even if we don't uh, come to a resolution today, that, you know, we can find a way to come to a, a resolution. And if we can't, that will be unfortunate. But, it, again, I just have to re reiterate that if we can't, <clears throat> still doesn't change what the cemetery is and you know someone did me a big favor by turning me into the state of california and saying that you know this guy is doing something illegally and they came out and they performed an investigation and they called me up and they said we visited the site can you send us all the information of your ownership which i have sent to san mateo county too because i filed all the paperwork and i pay all the tax bills and all those things uh and can you send it to us so we can review it? And I sent it all to Mr. James Fioka the very same day. Four hours later, he called me up, and he said, you got a clean bill of health. Uh, he gave me a letter to attest to that. Uh, we are a universal ministry cemetery, religious cemetery. And he said to me, I wish there was a, a thousand other guys just like you because this is a real problem across the state. So instead of making this a, a, a story about something that seems like it might be bad, it's a real feel-good story, and I think we should all be proud of what we have here in the backyard and that these citizens of Parisim are being treated with respect and dignity again. Because unfortunately, the prior plan of let's just uh, allow everything to grow up and engulf it so nobody goes there and everybody forgets about it, that was very disrespectful, and that didn't work. So, you know, all that's left of historic Parisim is that cemetery. And the town site is adjacent, but there's no homes left. There's nothing to tell the tale. People who live there, who work that land, they are next door on my property. And I just, uh, again, hope for a peaceful res resolution of this. And I thank you all for your time and uh, and moving forward. And that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Bixby. Um, we will let you know if the planning commissioners have any questions. Um, would you, the planning commissioners, like me to respond to some of the comments that were made before you um, ask your questions? Please, yes. Okay, I'd be happy to do so. Um, so 
as you've probably figured out, neither Tim nor I consider ourselves to be experts in cemetery law, but um, we do know quite a bit about land use and development in California's coastal zone, and we don't believe that there is anything within cemetery law that supersedes or obviates the need for coastal development permits within the coastal zone. So um, Mr. Bixby has not followed the permitting process required in California to conduct development on his land. And the planning and building department has had to respond to development that has occurred without the proper permits. If the plan of the rightful owner of the property, which still remains in question, and I think we disagree with his assertions in that regard, came in with an appropriately designed project that was limited to vegetation maintenance and um, had some provisions to enable <clears throat> controlled use by visitors, I think we would be enthusiastic about working with that applicant to coming to a resolution on how the historic cemetery can be best preserved and how visitation might occur in a manner that doesn't damage coastal resources. That unfortunately is not the project in front of you. Um, the project remains in our view um, undefined and I think the comments by Mr. Bixby indicate that his view is that he doesn't need a plan that he can conduct burials as he determines is fit, and we disagree with that assertion. So um, I'll turn to Tim to see if ha you want to say anything additionally. No, I no. Think so. Okay. With that, um, I think if you have questions for the applicant, now would be the time. Questions, Commissioner Santa Cruz? You have questions. Um, yeah, I have a couple of questions regarding the uh, statement of Mr. Bixby um, that uh, it may be a little bit redundant, but I need to understand the, the, if we have enough uh, gathering information before making a decision in regard to what he's saying and, and, and then also the part of the county gathering the necessary information to make a decision. In that regard, I would like to ask him, why does he know that, uh, that there's no impact in environment, as the county stated on the information, if, uh, Mr. Big said, you haven't done any studies that uh, require on the application? That's one question. Um, just in the interest of making sure that he understands and can answer that, could okay. we stop there and then you can proceed afterwards? Is that okay with you? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, Mr. Bixby, um, did you hear the question? Yes, I did. Okay, uh, and you're prepared to respond? Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm prepared to respond. Uh, well, my feeling is uh, because nothing that was removed was, a, was a substantial in any way, shape, or form concerning, when I say that, of any, of any size. It's not like we removed any kind of large trees with large root systems or we're talking about uh, poison oak bushes that might have been two and a half, three feet tall, maybe some were four feet tall, not giant swaths of areas. You know, we're talking uh, two passes with a lawnmower for a walking trail to uh, access the historical areas. Uh, you know, I've done a lot of development over my life, and I'm not going to uh, say that I'm a, a, an environmental engineer or anything like that, but I do understand what it means to remove certain things that would disturb the soil. We did no grading uh, whatsoever to the soil, so anything that was removed was just clipped off at the base uh, and mowed over. But again, it's such a minimal uh, space and area, and not near any kind of sloping and, and things like that that would create any kind of uh, you know unstable situation. So that that's why I say that. But the one thing that I wanted to, to mention, though, if I can say it real quickly, is that the reason I don't believe that I need that we can bury people and not need a, a use permit is we we existed prior we you know we are exempt from any of these because it has always been a cemetery and always been used as a cemetery so why would we need need special permission from anybody to continue its its use so but anyway all right go ahead i'm sorry if you have another question i'd be glad to answer it. 
Yeah, I, I like to uh, follow up on your statement that says that you believe that there's no need to have any permit because uh, you're exempt because it's part of the cemetery, right? It, it um, and if that is the case, it, have you provide all the necessary documentation to the to the county that uh, would allow the county uh, a little broader information regarding your point of view? Uh, I've provided everything that they've asked for. Um, no, I don't know that I, I may, I think I wrote that in the application, you know, my personal point of view concerning that, uh, but I haven't provided any kind of scientific data. Uh, again, I mean, you know, it wasn't part of, initially, the conversation I had with Dave Holbrook that was, you know, was concerned the structures. You know, in my eyes, the use never was an issue. You know, we never needed permission to use it for what we're using it for. So really, uh, the way I, we looked at it was was the, the structures that were erected. And uh, and that med vegetation, well, you know, it, it, I guess that's up for interpretation, but it certainly was nothing that would have a, a major impact on anything or anybody, and certainly not Bursna Creek or destabilizing any kind of soils because nothing, we don't even bring anything bigger than a lawnmower in there just for, because we don't. It's been too environmentally sensitive. Okay, well, in, in, in my point of view, it, 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 in, if you know any uh, provision, uh, if I'm, let's say, if I'm planning to do a project and the county is stating one point of view, the only way I could prevail in my point of view is the providing all the provision or necessary legal documentation that will uh, make sure the county understand that your point of view is the one should be prevailing and uh, not necessary to provide any additional um, gathering of data as you suggested, because uh, as you initially stated in your phone conversation, if you wanted to resolve this in a very amicable manner, um, then the necessary information needs to provide, needs to be provided in terms of a legal point of view in that. And uh, that's my 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 question to him. But I have another question for for Tim. And and if I if I may, um, Go ahead. Uh, I I think that before my point of view, it, it, and we feel more comfortable if if we have more information about the decommission that uh, Commissioner Hanson was was uh, stating initially so we understand the whole scope legally speaking whether this person uh, technically uh, his point of view uh, and the way he approached the cemetery uh, um, it could be interpreted one way or the other when we know more about the legal aspect of, of this of this project so um, I'll hand it over to Tim as necessary, but um, the decommissioning is for the purposes of changing the cemetery to a different use, a non-cemetery use. That's not what Mr. Bixby is proposing. So I don't really see the decommissioning being an issue here. I think the issue really boils down to w was the legal non-conforming use abandoned? And um, if he did, he satisfy permit requirements to reestablish the use as a burial, active burial ground. We do not um, have any issue with visitation of existing graves. We believe if improvements are made to enhance that visitation, they need to be made subject to a permit to make sure they're conducted in accordance with all applicable regulations. But um, with regard to what our rules say regarding an abandonment of a legal non-conforming use, um, non-conforming use is considered abandoned if it was voluntarily terminated um, for a period of at least 18 months. And I think it's fair to say that a great number of years, not just 18 months, passed uh, since the site was originally used as an active burial ground. So um, I know that's not directly specific to your question, um, Commissioner uh, Santa Cruz, but I thought it was opportunity for me to put that on the record. Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, um, that's that's up to the chair, Mr. Bixby. Um, so oh, let okay. um, council complete the response, and then the chair will right, decide. Right. Right. 
So um, what's before the commission today is an application. An applicant has applied for permits. There's a controversy between the county and the applicant about whether he needs those permits, but that's actually not for the commission to decide. The commission is here to decide whether or not he gets the permits he applied for. And at the moment, staff has analyzed whether or not Mr. Bixby's application for a CDP, a use permit, and a planned agricultural district permit meets the county standards. My uh, analysis of the staff report and my recommendation to you is that we stay focused on those questions in the application. May the applicant get the permits applied for. The county as an institution has a separate uh, issue with Mr. Bixby about whether or not he has adequately demonstrated that he doesn't need those permits. But it, it is, it, it's actually never, uh, to my knowledge, uh, presented to the commission the legal question about whether or not permits are necessary. That's a staff function, not a commission function. And Mr. Bixby's argument that he can proceed with certain land uses without the need to get a permit is something that probably will go on after today's hearing. Um, there, there will, there will be ongoing controversy about the scope of his, uh, right to use the land without the need to get the permits. But right now, what we're here today to meet about is he's applied for permits. Staff has recommended that he be denied those permits. And that's really the question before the commission on, on the question of decommissioning. I do want to clarify, um, I, I, I don't have doubt in my mind about whether or not to conduct a cemetery use in the coastal zone you need a CDP. So I'm staying focused on the land use question, whether or not Mr. Bixby as a matter of state law in other parts of the state would have the right to resume burial operations outside of the coastal zone. That's an interesting question, but it's not one that I have to answer today. Um, so I, I, I'm staying focused on the question of when you commence or resume a burial operation in the coastal zone, do you need a CDP to do it? And I believe the answer to that question is yes. Okay. And, and to the Thank degree you, there is a dispute regarding that, since Tim mentioned, you know, that's not really why we're here today. Um, there is a process to resolve disputes regarding uh, needs for coastal development permits, and that uh, dispute resolution process rests with the California Coastal Commission. And, uh, you know, Mr. Bixby could potentially go to them and ask for their confirmation that he doesn't require a coastal development permit. But based on our conversations with the staff there today, I don't think he would prevail on that issue. Okay, thank you. Thank you, you Steve. Uh, uh, Mr. Bixby, uh, you wanted to add something, uh, your comments? Yes, absolutely. I was just wanted to comment on the... Uh the abandonment issue. Uh, once again, cemetery law is very separate and distinct, and, and there is no time limit concerning when, uh, you know, like a resting period or how often you're burying people. I mean, it, there's never been a, uh, an operation resuming. It, it, it was always operating. As a matter of fact, people were being buried there prior to me, my ownership, just two years prior there been a, a burial. So the, the time period really means nothing. And, and, you know, if we got farther along into this, it would be proven. So, you know, the only way you can abandon the cemetery use is to abandon it legally, and it never was abandoned. And ironically, and I, and I, I want to hear more, and I'll, this will be an off the phone conversation about the resolution through the Coastal Commission itself, because ironically, when I went into this project, I was put onto this project by Timothy Duff, who works for the Coastal Commission. And uh, they were working along with Coastside Land Trust at one point in time when they were trying to create their own burial ground there by taking the town site and making it larger. And uh, they were a very big proponent in why we moved forward. So I would love to know more about that because I think that that's the avenue uh, to where we can find our resolution. With permission Thank of the you. chair, I can respond to his question because um, I am aware that there has been an interest in um, conducting additional burials on the site. Um, there, I think it's the land trust that is uh, owns land nearby and considered uh, whether or not they could conduct burials as a means to support their um, land use preservation objectives. Um, we did work with them for some time to 
lay out what we believe is the process required to establish um, an active burial ground, um, and they wound up um, not pursuing that. So um, I think there was maybe some partnership with the Coastal Conservancy in discussions in that regard, not the Coastal Commission that established permits requirements. So that's my understanding of what occurred. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from the commissioners? Um, Mr. Bixby, uh, I had uh, some basic questions and then um, I would like to comment on what our uh, counsel Tim Fox said uh, as to what is in front of our commission. So my question is, how long have you been um, the owner, or uh, how how long have you been affiliated uh, with this uh, cemetery? Uh, I have been affiliated since July 31st, 2017. That's when I filed my notice of adverse possession. Uh, I have been working on this project uh, since February of 2017. And uh, can I ask a question? Has, go ahead, Hans. Since it's adverse claiming of the property, is he really the owner of the property yet? Or, I mean, is he the proper person to come forward until someone says, yes, you are? Is that the name? I'm sorry. We... Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take a crack at answering that first. When I went to law school, I never imagined that I would be faced with a question relating to adverse possession. It is a rather arcane area of the law. Um, and this is uh, certainly a unique circumstance in which to first encounter it. My understanding of the law of adverse possession is that it's a defense to ejectment by the true owner. In other words, when the true owner shows up and says, you've got to leave, a person who has adversely possessed the property for the statutory period has a legal defense to being ejected from the property. So I think there's a very valid question to ask whether prior to the expiration of the statutory period, Mr. Bixby or his organization are the owners within the sense that our zoning regulations require that only an owner may apply for a land use permit for uh, an activity. Um, we have processed the application nevertheless. Um, I believe Mr. Bixby has a different interpretation of the law of adverse possession as, as he has a different interpretation of um, some other laws that we've, we've discussed already. But um, I, I, at this sitting here right now, we have processed the application and recommended denial, but uh, I, I have an open question in my mind whether uh, there might be some other person or entity out there that could just as readily apply for a permit for this property and what that necessarily means for uh, the county's determination of these issues. It's complicated. I don't, want to, I don't want to say that it somehow gives an easy answer to whether or not the permit application should be granted or denied. I don't think it does. Um, but in my mind, there is an open question whether or not during the statutory period, the person who's claiming an adverse possession, possessory interest can proceed to apply for permits in the stead of the, the, the fee owner of the land. Thank you. I can comment on that if any, if you would like me to. Yeah. Uh, please go ahead, Mr. Bixby. Okay. Uh, just a little bit of background on it. So we, we did a lot of work on this, you know, and we did a lot of title work before we actually filed this action, and that was very important. And uh, what we found is that, you know, through that title work that the, the you know, the clear and defined owner, the only uh, recorded deed was the Christmas Cemetery Association itself. So, of course, possession is nine-tenths of the law. So, you know, when you do notice of adverse possession, you not only have to possess the land, but you actually have, actively have to work the land to, to demonstrate that you, you know, that you are asserting your adverse possession claim. So we did exactly that. Uh, since then, we have uh, reinstituted the Prisma Cemetery Association because it, through the state of California, we found that they did not have to file articles of incorporation or anything like that way back when. That's not something that was required. So I told them the situation and I said, you know, the association 
never cease to exist, just the people who were involved you know, cease to exist because they don't live anymore. Uh, so we reenacted the Christmas Cemetery Association, and ironically, you know, they, the original deed still is in force through the Christmas uh, Cemetery Association itself. Of course, I'm three years into my notice of adverse possession, so I have two more years, but I clearly own it. Someone could test, contest it, but anything short of a deed, they can't contest my ownership. The deed we know exists, and it's in the association's name, which we are the association. So I understand it is a very complicated sounding thing, but, uh, you know, in two years I'll be able to go before a judge and get, uh, seek a quiet uh, action on the title, meaning that no one can contest it from that point forward. But we would never have been involved in this if, if there was any outside chance of anyone else being able to assert any type of ownership. So uh, that, that's my take on it. Um, so, have you submitted uh, any uh, documentation uh, stating that to the county? Yes, I have. I've noted, I've, not only have I submitted it, but I actually filed it in the county itself. So, I have filed paperwork through the county show, showing my adverse possession, showing all the things that I discussed. And I did send a copy of the original deed. I did send the the uh, Articles of Incorporation and all the things that go along with the association. Uh, and they have, they possess, they possess some of this stuff already in the record rooms, but I did, I did submit all that as well. So, um, in your mind, uh, because we are showing here that your application is still incomplete, uh, and no approval can take place without a completed application. So, do you understand what is uh, what you still need to provide to the county? I yes, I that that I do understand that in the eyes of the planning board, it be deemed incomplete. And I'll tell you why it's incomplete was that when I was originally when I originally talked to Mr. Holbrook and I said, listen. We're, we're not going to come to an agreement here because he wanted me to, to say that I was going to apply for, like, you know, like the cemetery didn't exist and we were going to start over kind of situation. And I said that, you know, the cemetery exists, it operates, I don't, you know, I don't care what you have to say, and I don't mean that disrespectfully, just meaning that in, the, in my eyes of cemetery law, we are, we're operating okay. It was a matter of improvements. So he sent me a document and said, listen, if you apply to these, these improvements, you know, we can try to move this forward, and, and I was amicable with that. But what ended up happening was, after I did that and hired a surveyor to do all the things I needed to do, uh, someone else in the staff, uh, I, I think Dave might have been gone, or maybe he's still there, I don't know, but they, re they requested a bunch more stuff that was not part of the initial conversation, and it had more to do with the cemetery than it did, you know, the issues at hand. And I said, well, I'm not, I'm not doing that because that wasn't part of what we initially talked about. And $9,000 in, you know, I was like, well, you know, I'm going to apply for what you told me to apply for. Uh, nothing, you know, nothing more concerning the cemetery use because you can't tell me what I can or can't do with the cemetery use itself. I'm more than glad to continue to try to satisfy what needs to be satisfied because I, I want to be able to move forward. But within reason, if it has anything to do with the operation of the cemetery, I, I don't agree with it because I... I'm a pre-existing, non-conforming use. No, no amount of time that ever passed will take that away from us, and that's just plain, simple, and period. So, I, if if you guys were to, if we could have a discussion and say, okay, this is what we need to, to move forward, and it didn't have to pertain to archaeological reports and all kinds of things that are unnecessary concerning the operation of a cemetery that already existed, then I would absolutely consider saying, yes, okay, let's move forward and, and resolve this. I'm not trying to be unreasonable. It's just I felt as if I got a little hoodwinked when I went into it. And, in, and you know, I said, I'm, I, I'm never going to apply for something that I don't need to apply for. Uh, so that's, I do understand your dilemma, that you have an application that, yes, is, is deemed in the eyes of the county incomplete, but that's why it's incomplete. You know, if you needed some sort of report from someone to say, okay, the vegetation at the location you know, has done this or that or whatever, then I would, you know, I would consider moving forward and, yes, getting that done. But 
at that point in time, I felt like I was almost in a lost cause, to be completely honest with you. So I thought, let's stop the bleeding at the moment and get to the meeting and have this discussion, and then maybe we can pick things up and move forward, or maybe we can't. But I didn't want to continue to spend throw good money after bad, in particular for things that did not pertain to the operation of the cemetery itself, the use, I should say. Thank you, Mr. Bixby. You're uh, welcome. Uh, Steve has already responded to uh, some of this. Is there anything more you would like to add? Uh, well, just for the benefit of Mr. Bixby and the commission, um, I think the original discussions that occurred with a former planner, Dave Holbrook, had to do with the fact that the cemetery is not currently listed as an allowed use in the planned agricultural district. And so in order to um, enable a new, an active cemetery to be established, it's our view that we would uh, need to amend the local coastal program. Um, so when uh, that, uh, when Mr. Bixby didn't want to go through that process, we had to deal with the structures that he placed on the property. And as I said earlier, um, we think that there may be room to permit through the coastal development process minor facilities that allow for visitation of existing burials. Um, but the dispute, I think, is really over um, new burials. Mm -hmm. And we are viewing that as development that is both unpermitted and also not allowed by our local coastal program. Um, and so then the question became, lacking the information required to approve such a permit, what should we do with that? I think um, one option, a legally defensible option, would be to not move it forward until it is complete. But the reason we moved it forward is because we want to get a final resolution on this matter. We have folks who are interested in potentially purchasing burials and want to know whether or not it will be legal and, um, you know, whether or not they can do it. Uh, and so we believe it's important to get to a final resolution, and we thought presenting the application in its non-complete state for action by the Planning Commission was an important step in getting to final resolution. Thank you, Steve. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Bixby? Uh, Open to the public. So at this time, I, I would like to uh, open, I'm open to uh, any public speakers who would like to uh, make any comments. Uh, do we have any speaker cards? None. So barring no um, speaker cards, uh, we would like to close the public hearing. So move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So the public hearing is closed. Um, I'll open the floor for the commissioners to uh, for discussion. I'll start. Oh, do you want to go first? No. <laughs> it was very clear in 1976 what the state of California wanted to do when Prop 20 went on the ballot. It passed overwhelmingly. It over through all existing zoning for the coast side and put a new structure in of which we've been participating, chief, coming up to 40 something years. You know, there is a structure and it was an intentional structure to slow development and protect the coast side on many different levels. And we have always been consistently following the process. I don't see this as a time of abandoning that process. I may support what he's doing. I mean, thinking I have no personal objections against green burials or, um, you know, the first time I ever came to this cemetery was in 1964 with the Boy Scouts. It wasn't cleared then. I was a lot of poison oak then. but. I've, I've known of this for a long time. Um, but it is very clear, and my, my rulings have always been to follow 
the rules that have been in place since the early 1970s and without a complete uh, uh, workup on this, I can't move forward. Uh, it was very clear, the population, uh, how we voted, this is what we want to do. We want to be very deliberate of what we do. So I will support denial. Commissioner Ketchum. Motion. Is there anything you would like to say before we make a motion? Um, I, I totally agree with the Commissioner Hansen, but the, my feeling is that um, in one hand, Mr. Bixie, if he believes that the decision of the country cannot prevail for whatever reason, um, he kind of like also fail to show the county the reason why it cannot be denied. And uh, it's a catch-22. Uh, on one hand, he's failing to provide the necessary documentation, whether it's provision of the law or anything, to, to kind of like to the county to, to prevail his point of view. And uh, if lacking that information, uh, the only option is to deny because the application is incomplete. And in that regard, I kind of like agree with Commissioner Hansen. Not that I agree um, in 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 with the county decision totally, because uh, because uh, maybe we can in good faith trying to work out the situation. But it looks like uh, Mr. Bixie has denied or or had not provided the necessary documentation uh, required, as he eloquently speak on on the phone. Um, you know, provided to the county, and and I'm concerned because in my district and the district that I represent through um, through uh, Supervisor Canepa, we have the highest concentration of cemeteries in the whole um, uh, county of San Mateo. And the more cemeteries for us is the better because we need to have other places where people can go and do the burial, especially if they're green burials. Um, I encourage. Uh, Mr. Bixby to um, provide all the necessary information, um, whether it be legally or provision or any kind of thing that support his point of view that says that the county cannot, uh, cannot deny um, th this request because he thinks like he has any legal grounds to have a county hands off on his project. And uh, that, that's... that's uh, because of that, I am inclined to to also um, recommend that the application be denied for incompletion. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Santa Cruz. I have just one comment to make uh, before we go on to the motion. Is I truly believe that we should respect the process and in. Uh, work with the county in a timely manner. So that is my only comment and uh, comment to Mr. Bixby is that we, that we would like him to work with the county. It's not that we do not want to approve projects, but it's not in this form at this time. Thank you. Go ahead. I move denial of the requested CDP, PAD, and use permits. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So the motion is carried. The project is, the uh, permit is denied, four to zero, with uh, Commissioner Ramirez absent. And uh, for the benefit of Mix, Mr. Bixby, I wanted uh, him to know that this decision is appealable to the Board of Supervisors. An appeal form must be completed and an appeal fee submitted within 10 days of this hearing date. Thank you, Mr. Thank Bixby. You. All right, thank you very much. Okay. Moving on to... Agenda item number two. Janet, would you please read that for the record? Item number two, owner, Sergey Bowley, applicant, Henry Manick, file number PLN 2010-00079, 
location 1455 Audubon Avenue in Montera. Excuse me. Did you say 000 79 or 59? 00079. Uh, okay. There's a different number in the um, in the agenda. Or my or am I seeing the wrong number? No, I think it's the wrong number. It says an agenda says zero zero five nine. Right. The the file number on the agenda uh, ends in five nine, but that doesn't necessarily preclude you from proceeding. No, I understand that, but I okay. just want to make my point clear. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize for the confusion. It should be seven nine. That's okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Angela Chavez, uh, planner here with the current planning section. Um, I, I'm going to just start off with the general project location. I'll move on to project description um, and then um, show you the plans. So the project site is located um, in the rural area just outside the urban rural boundary. Um, amongst large parcels, which um, are mainly developed with low density residential development. Um, the subject property is bordered by Montero Creek on its southern boundary, with riparian vegetation reaching into the west, western and eastern portions of the parcel. Um, in addition, the parcel has been identified as having environmentally sensitive habitat areas, which includes special status plants um, and the potential to support uh, special status species. Um, the parcel is currently undeveloped, but has been utilized to keep horses in the past. Um, so here we can see the parcel's uh, relationship to both Highway 1 and to the ocean. Um, the uh, Montero Creek runs um, from your vantage point, kind of the squiggly line um, along the southern portion of the parcel. So project description. Um, the project proposes to construct a new 4,500 square foot single family residence, a 557 square foot detached garage, and a 1,700 17 square foot detached accessory building. Um, throughout, we'll also see that referred to as a barn, um, but um, because of the lack of clarity as to what sort of agricultural uses might be present or be pursued in, in future development, um, staff was more comfortable referring to that as an accessory building. Um, the project also includes the construction of a septic system, the conversion of an existing agricultural well to domestic use. It also includes the installation of water storage tanks and cisterns, the construction of 645 linear feet of driveway, which includes three turn arounds or turnouts, and a small bridge which crosses an existing culvert. Um, in order to execute these improvements, the project also includes 3,483 cubic yards of grading ac activity. Um, so here we have a site plan. Um, the parcel itself is outlined in blue um, with the two closest um, other parcels kind of shown off to the right here. Um, the orange, kind of yellowish, um, that we see box is the limit of the development area. Uh, the barn, our accessory building, is sort of outlined in this green color. And then towards the bottom of the slide, you'll see the house and detached garage. Um, also highlighted the proposed uh, driveway, which uses this configuration in, in order to avoid some sensitive habitats, which I'll go into a little bit later. So here we have the western elevation of the proposed residence. And here the east. Um, the north elevation, which would be uh, facing the two neighbors that we saw along, or neighboring properties that we saw along the right side. And then here the southern elevation of the proposed main residence. 
Um, the proposed uh, detached garage is shown here. And then the accessory building barn elevations, um, the western, southern, and eastern bound, uh, elevations are shown on this slide. And then the north elevation, which would be the elevation, again, facing the neighboring properties that we saw to the right, is shown here. Um, in terms of the regulation compliance or conformi conformity, um, many of the regulations that we are looking at show um, a significant amount of similarity in the intent and goals. Um, the applicable policies are shown here. Um, more specifically, the standards um, that we're looking at focus on the proposed project's potential impacts on vegetative, water, fish, and wildlife resources, sensitive habitats, protection of significant vegetation, uh, visual quality, the protection of agricultural lands and soil resources, and limiting the amount of grading or ground disturbance. Um, most constraining to this proposed projects were the presence of sensitive habitats. So I'm going to just move on. So the applicant conducted this very thorough analysis along with their biologist um, to determine what the presence of resources were and what the LCP requires in terms of protection boundaries. So we're seeing that um, the resources generally in the kind of reddish color, 50-foot uh, buffer shown beyond that, and then 100-foot buffer outside of that. Um, so the applicant's biologist assessment noted that 63 special status plant species had the potential to occur within the study area based on its database and literature research. Um, however, the site visits determined that the project parcel only has a high potential to support um, California wild strawberry, which is present on the site, and a moderate potential to support nine other special status species. Um, in regard to wildlife, um, the biologist assessment noted that the resource databases identified 67 special status wildlife species that have been documented in the general project area. Um, site visits and further research determined that the project site has a high potential to only support two special status wildlife species, um, Allen's hummingbird and a white-tailed kite. Um, and a moderate potential for five other special status wildlife species, including the hoary bat, northern harrier, olive-sided flycatcher, a lo logger-headed shrike, and, a monarch, and the monarch butterfly. Um, the assessment also included a review for the California red-legged frog and San, Fr and San Francisco gar garter snake, which are two federally listed protected species and that have been documented to occur within the project vicinity. Um, the assessment noted that um, no red-legged frog were observed during the site visits, but that the project site provides potential upland habitat. Um, further, that the proposed development is adequately distanced from the aquatic habitats located on the parcel, namely Montero Creek, um, and that the general project vicinity avoids any significant impacts. Um, in addition, uh, the presence of wetlands, as I mentioned, riparian habitat, uh, Montero Creek, coastal terrace prairie, um, and the project's site's location within the Fitzgerald Marine Reserve watershed are all noted and discussed in the staff report. Mitigation measures, which include best management practices, avoidance measures, and resource-specific requirements were provided by the biologist to ensure that potential impacts associated with the development um, results in less than significant impacts. Um, these measures were included in the initial study and mitigated negative declaration, and also as conditions of approval in attachment A. Um, this is just a more zoomed in project site, again, just for consistency, showing the edge of the development boundary, and then the project's relationship to uh, sensitive habitats. 
Um, in terms of other uh, re regulations, um, the project was reviewed by the county's Agricultural Advisory Committee um, in March of 2011 and received a recommendation for approval. Um, the project was also reviewed by the Coastside Design Review Committee, and it received a recommendation for approval in November, uh, on November 12, 2015. Um, the project was found to comply with the required development standards um, as shown here. So in terms of the initial study and mitigated negative declaration, um, as mentioned, we prepared and circulated that from March 2nd, 2018 to April 2nd, 2018. Um, we did receive two sets of comments to that circulation. Um, those have been provided for you um, in section B of the report under environmental review. Um, specifically, those came from um, the California Coastal Commission and one um, neighboring property. Um, specifically, the Coastal Commission uh, raised concerns regarding uh, the barn and the 50-foot reduced buffer for the seasonal wetland. Um, so in response, if you look through the initial study, there's the original barn design was included. The, the recommendation that we're including is a revised design. Um, that redesign was in keeping with the original aesthetic but the applicant chose to break up the floor plan. So initially there were walls and really defined spaces um, that kind of were inconsistent with a general barn design. Um, so they broke up the floor plan by creating three areas which are open to each other. Um, they also redesigned the structure by slightly reducing the square footage. There were also wraparound decks that have been removed, um, and they relocated uh, water storage tanks that were uh, originally included within the deck structure. Um, secondly, the Coastal Commission expressed concern regarding the compliance with LCP policy 7.18, which establishes the required buffer zones for wetlands. Um, as noted in the staff report, the applicant's biologist did initiate a review with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife um, regarding the reduced wetland buffer as required by the LCP policy. Um, however, California Department of Fish and Wildlife determined that the subject wetland did not meet their jurisdictional threshold to provide consultation. Um, staff discussed this directly with CDF, or excuse me, with California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, and the staff was able to confirm verbally that they had received a copy of the initial study and mitigated negative declaration um, that was provided through that, to them through the state clearinghouse circulation process, and they provided no comments at that time. Um, in terms of the comments provided by the neighbor, they largely center on the design and placement of the proposed development. Um, the discussion of those issues was also, again, included under Section B of the staff report. Um, and moving on. Um, staff would like to note that four comment letters were received. Um, these comments are largely focused on the protection of sensitive habitats and the height of the proposed structures. Unfortunately, those all sort of came in <laughs> over yesterday, and due to time constraints, staff was unable to address these formally, but I am available to answer any questions the commission may have um, on those submittals. Um, therefore, based on staff's analysis and discussions in the staff report, is our recommendation that the Planning Commission adopt the initial study and mitigated negative declaration, approve the requested permits subject to the recommended findings and conditions of approval in attachment A. Uh, this concludes my presentation, and I'm available again if you have any questions. Thank you, Angela. Uh, commissioners have questions for uh, our planner? Um, Anna, I, want, I have a question. Actually, I have two questions. The, 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 I haven't had a chance to in detail review this section, but um, is there any protected tree to be removed from this project, like as part of this project? Um, so there were originally trees included 
for removal um, when the project was initially submitted. Um, unfortunately, due to drought conditions, there have been several failures. Um, so uh, those are no longer uh, necessary in order to execute the project. Okay. And then the second question is, you mentioned the red-legged frog. Yes. Um, that um, is there any study on the red-legged frog impacted uh, to be included in attachment A or, or, or there has ever been one? Yeah. So um, the applicant actually hired a specialist biologist to study just the red-legged frog and the garter snake. So um, there's a full assessment of all the different resources that were was included as an attachment to the initial study negative declaration, but there was also a study conducted done specifically for the frog and for the snake. Um, so that has been done and there are some mitigation measures and avoidance measures that are included as uh, recommend. Uh, as part of the condition. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Commissioner Hansen. Hi. Hello. So when I lived in the coast side, I had two Nubian goats. And I learned that Nubian goats will eat anything but rocks. So we're talking about having one to 10 animals, which could possibly be goats, right? Yeah. So um, as we were looking at addressing some of the comments that came from both the Coastal Commission and from the neighbor in regards to the use um, of the accessory building barn. Um, we wanted to understand if we're considering this building as potentially an agricultural building, you know, what would be those uses that you might utilize that space for? So we asked that from the applicant. I don't know that any of that is actually what they intend to do. So there may not be animals. There may not be animals, oh, yeah. Okay. So, so I, I'll ask the applicant when. Yes. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Commissioner Ketchum. So the, the drawing of the accessory building has a tractor exit out the back. Yes. And um, that seems to me to be a significant agricultural operation that would merit that kind of expense and basically where the tractor access is headed is towards the sensitive habitat and and the comment was made in the letter about constrained paddocks or whatever that all the vegetation would be killed so I don't um, so what would this tractor access be for if it's not my, my understanding is the property owner has like a severe allergy to, um, I can defer to the, op to the applicant, but um, it's basically for just site management, not for, not that any vegetation should be removed. And they're acutely aware of what is present on the site um, and have attempted to design in a way to avoid that. Um, you know, we could always, include permanent measures to delineate that, but um, you know it, they, they are acutely aware of what's present. Any other question? Um, I can answer the issue that went to the question. Please, uh, yes. Uh, so, um, Give me a moment. <laughs> Try to draw the storage. Okay. One more moment. So this uh, property did have, uh, or may still have horses? Uh, Not currently, um, in the past. In the past they had that. Yes. Yes, okay. Um, so going to the other cattle, 
I, I believe that's what... Uh, so the planned agricultural district defines, you know, what would be feasible um, overall, like, what you know, is it dry farming, is it grazing, uh, prime soil, you know, there's, there's different definitions within the regulations about what we defined when we called something planned agricultural, or we defined it as a planned agricultural district. This particular property was defined as being suitable for grazing. So we did look at, like, what the carrying capacity might be, and um, at the time, um, confirmed with um, one of the other planners that was working uh, along with the um, Agriculture Advisory Committee about what the carrying capacity would be. And really, it would be infeasible to do large-scale agriculture in terms of cattle grazing on this particular property because of the constraints and, and really the size. So my next question is about this barn. The barn seemed to have full, almost a full bath there. Is that uh, also in that intended to be used for housing? No. Uh, or, uh, no, there's nothing that precludes a full bathroom within the current regulations, um, but there's no, I received no indication that they were looking to um, occupy that space for habitation. And, and one comment I had on the, in the report, the table that we have, uh, which says how the, uh, what are the standards and what is the proposed, yes. uh, it's on page 14. Mm -hmm. Uh, minimum lot size proposed says 8,199 acres. I think there's a... Oh, I'm sorry. That should, a, be, a, yeah, that should be a period. A typo, there's a typo. <laughs> Not a comma. Yeah, the, the first time I saw it, I said that's a... No, that should be a period, a not a comma. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and the other uh, typo is uh, the address of this location. Uh, it should be Avenue. It huh? should be Avenue. Unfortunately, and I'm not quite sure what happened, we are getting it corrected, um, but our mapping, for some reason, um, is showing only this side of, uh, so the western side of Audubon as street, mm -hmm. and everything else is Avenue. Avenue. So Avenue is correct, okay. um, but there are some mapping errors that we are working to correct. Okay. And my last question is about the uh, one of the letters, uh, the correspondence, they talk about LCP re requiring these 100-foot buffers. Uh, you, you mentioned that there was some correspondence that you were unable to respond to because they came last minute? Correct. So um, could you comment on that, that yeah, so why we don't have that in so, certain places? So uh, basically for uh, wetland protection, the LCP says that you should either provide 100 feet or you can provide 50 feet, but with the consultation of the Department of Fish and Wildlife. So that was sort of what I was mentioning. So as the comment initially came from the Coastal Commission, we conveyed that to the applicant. They reached out, did that consultation. Unfortunately, Fish and Wildlife determined that it didn't meet their threshold for consultation. However, they were sent a copy of the initial study and mitigated negative declaration as part of the circulation process, and they confirmed that they did not provide comments at that time. So in staff's opinion, it there is a allowance for 50 feet, and the applicant has met that requirement. Uh, because they also talk about uh, having the 50 feet and then extending it to the edge. Uh, edge of the grading. Yeah, so right. I, I'm not sure if how clear 
it is on these plans. I didn't upload the civil plans, but they are included in your packets. Um, currently, the parcel has um, outfall of some grady of some stormwater that falls from the neighboring properties onto this site. So, um, and it's in the vicinity of the wetland. So, what? the applicant is proposing is basically installing not only the vegetated soil, but some stormwater measures to help treat, slow the velocity of that water, and then channel it into the, um, there's a small culvert that then will fall out to uh, engineered riprap and some other vegetated areas so that we can protect um, Montero Creek. So again, this is, um, an area as of biological significance um, due to the proximity to Fitzgerald Marine Reserve. Um, and so we could extend it, but we actually have other measures that are looking to protect other resources um, that we've included or that are that included outside the 50 feet, but within the 100 feet. Can you point on this? Um, so I again, drawing? unfortunately, I didn't include the civil drawings. Yeah, but, but um, which area we are talking about? Here? So basically, if you um, you'll see. So um, uh, here's the driveway. It sort of loops around here. Um, the seasonal wetland is this spot that we're seeing. The 50-foot buffer is delineated with this dashed line. Um, when we look at the, um, the engineering plans, there are measures that are included that include a vegetated swale and then some rock gardens and um, some rainwater collection that would all be kind of located in and around this area, which would, if we extended out 100 feet, you know, would take us kind of off the property in this direction and would extend kind of into the driveway over here. So, I mean, we could, we could extend it out, but then understanding that, um, you know, we do have some things that we're trying to achieve in terms of slowing the velocity and treating water before it exits this area. Um, and that we, we, it's not guaranteed that we would get 100 feet on all sides just because of its location. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Angela. Um, would the applicant like to address uh, the commission at this time? Uh, please step please to the mic. come to the mic. Uh, And please state your name and uh, affiliation, and you have 15 minutes. May I have the uh, constraints map brought up? It's the one with the, the color images, mostly orange. My name is, uh, my name is Henry Manick. I'm the architect for the project. Um, uh, the one, that one, yes. I'm also the uh, structural engineer. I'd like to use my time to sort of talk about uh, a larger picture, and that ties into some of the environmental issues that go uh, with the, sort of the, the issues that have, that have been raised um, about the, the project. Sherwood engineers are the civil engineers. They have an outstanding reputation in the Bay Area um, for uh, civil engineering. I first worked with them on a project when I was a structural engineer. On that project, we won the American Institute of Architects Committee on Environment. They picked 10 projects out of the United States as the top projects in this country. Our project won. So it's, as a designer, I have worked on projects and starting when I was 30, uh, in around uh, 1990s, been working on projects that deal with sustainability. And this is a very sort of important part. We worked, we're working with the engineers. They're actually very hard to work with because they're so busy. Uh, at times I just pull my hair because I can't get through to them. Um, but they are very responsive and they just, we aren't building a coal mine here. We're really trying. So this project in terms of sustainability issues is when you think about what happens 
in earthquakes. It's similar to when you're driving in a car. If you have a collision in a parking lot, it's a fender bender and you just fix them. That's like shingles on your house. During an earthquake, that's like a highway collision. You have an impact zone on your car. So when you collide another car on 101, the um, body crumples and absorbs the energy to protect you. The car, it, you throw it away. It's landfill. You don't reuse it. <clears throat> when I engineer by code a plywood shear wall, the nails are the crumple zone. They're bending. You put up a sheet of plywood, you put in the nails, and those nails bend, and that's absorbing the energy. That is the crumple zone, and it's disposable. So if you're remodeling your kitchen, you tear out your kitchen, you put up the cheap plywood, you put in the cheap nails, and you put in a really expensive finish, the impact zone, the throwaway structure is behind there. So when I, I look at buildings, and I've been doing this since I started my practice, of how buildings perform by, you know, during earthquakes. So now what I do to try to convince clients of the hazards and what we're facing is I show not code level, but I go not code level, like the minimum threshold, but I go to the top. I do the best possible plywood building allowed by law. A plywood building, you could do a little bit better, but it's just a bit. And then I show the actual damage that that building. So like this house and every house that I sort of work on, there's a house in Montana currently where we went through this exercise. What happens is the drywall, Best possible plywood building by code. The drywall is cracked. It's, this is based on actual shake cable tests, things I've researched. I've taken the plywood and you know, the code level calculations, compared them to studies that are happening in uh, labs, and they match. And so what happens is, in a typical best case plywood building, the drywall nail has popped, it's cracked, and it's coming off the wall. So this is the standard buildings, and so this is in San Mateo County. That's what we're facing on the San Andreas Fault from Pacifica all the way down past here. And so imagine all of those buildings, and that's just not to code. Most buildings don't even meet the code. They're below that. And so you can imagine the amount of devastation that we're facing. That's the time bomb that we're sitting on. I've worked in Haiti uh, working on reconstruction where we took rubble and turn it into uh, new houses. And it's possible. You can take those mounds of rubble and turn them into houses. But the horrific part of earthquakes is there are human remains in there. People don't want to use that rubble. And so it is just this question of like, you know, people here, like, what, are you, what is the plan for the glass? What is the plan for the drywall, the stucco, and all these pieces? Where is it going to be stockpiled? Where is it going to be disposed? What's the plan? The best thing is to avoid that. So this project is designed and each one of those buildings has a different strategy on how to harden it against the financial loss. Because by code, I'm a structural engineer. I can't kill you. That's against the law. I go to jail. And so I have to design a building so you can evacuate. And that's my job. What you walk out into and what you come back into is not my problem unless you hire me specifically to deal with it. And that's what uh, this client, and this is of all the jobs, I've been given the most sort of latitude of really understanding and how to mitigate this type of damage. And so there is this sort of um, environmental component that really isn't talked about. Most people have a hard time sort of understanding. I am using this sort of few minutes to be on a soapbox because everyone here, you have an impact. So imagine the quake. So I live on the East Bay in Berkeley. My fault there is, you know, it's ready to go at any time. Um, and San Andreas is likely to go sometime like in 2060. Um, so we're likely to see the Hayward Fault, but not the 1906. But if you look at a playground, those kids will experience the Hayward event, and they'll experience 1906. They're going to live in it, and they'll be dealing with the mess that we're leaving them. So this house shows that it can be done. You know, we're making an effort to uh, show there is an alternative, and so after the quake, you can look at things. So there is, there's an important thing. So addressing the, um, the wetland and the issue that's specifically brought up is um, um, if you look on the, um, is there a pointer? No. Okay, so we're talking about this area here. And if you look right there, and if you go on to Google Earth, and you can see that's a well. And just below that well, I have an image on the, the laptop of the actual well. Here's the Hayward Fault Biology Center. Now, there's the, um, they were actually looking for 
Karen Swain, who is looking at the um, uh, uh, frogs and snakes. She was looking at an area down down here. We're standing here, and that area um, uh, also uh, can have seasonal water. And she was saying that she really wants this review by somebody who is an expert on wetlands because it was wet. She recommended Jeff Schmick at WRA. He's now sort of the head. At that time, he was a project manager. And he looked around, and he was uh, a wetland is defined by water, presence of water, the soil, and uh, the plants. And so it had two of those, but not three. I think it was the soil. And so it wasn't a wetland. And, but he looked around, and he followed it up toward the property line, and then he went up towards the well. And he did find this area below the well that um, uh, does have the presence of all three of these. I've also. You need to speak enough microphone because it's recorded. <clears throat> okay. So, um, so he did find those items, um, and I'd like to show you what the wetland looks like. And one of the items of sort of working on green projects, what's. Um, Computer locked up, and I had to. Um... Below the well, there's somehow uh, water is. Somehow... Thank you. Oh, yeah, speak you, in the mic, please. You will not be recorded if, if you are away from Even the mic. Yes. Yeah. So there is, when you're dealing with sort of environmental issues and designing projects, you just can't get away from causing harm. It's you're looking for the least. And so in this project, we are sort of focused on an issue that has enormous impact for every single seismic event. We're re the way we're designing right now, we're building buildings that have to be rebuilt. And whereas, you know, there are, this item came up and it's recorded as a wetland. And one way to think of it is, um, When you're looking at issues, what is the items we have to protect? You know, if there's a well that's impacting and allowing water to come to the surface, um, when that well gets repaired and that water is cut off, then legally um, one, one is allowed to repair the well. And then as the well gets repaired and that flow of water stops, then the water disappears, the plants disappear, the soil will remain for a very long time, but the components of the wetland aren't there. And so of all the issues that we're dealing with, is this the fight that really matters? You know, what, what are the issues that are involved? And you know, we've spent an enormous amount of money on environmental, sort of making sure that things are okay. We don't want to sort of cause harm out there. That's sort of like an, a, a broader issue. I'd like to go through uh, quickly and talk about the, um, um, the items that have been raised. Uh, first one is the tree removal and the, um, from the drought and the blight that's out there. Uh, trees have been failing and basically they, when they're sort of clearly, when we record images of them before they do get um, their images of the trees and what they look like. There is a, um, uh, Karen Swain uh, did a, a study on the, the red-legged frog. Um, in terms of, and the, the detail is uh, um, provided in there. She's spent a fair amount of time uh, coming out to the site and looking at the property. She was interested in the project. It's generally, it's much too small for her. But because of her interest uh, in Half Moon Bay and Pacifica, she wanted to know Montera better. And so she worked with us so that she can sort of have her understanding of species in this area. The um, client, um, she does have uh, chickens currently. I think there may be nine right now. So the property will have chickens. They're going to move out there. 
Um, there may be a goat, but uh, not likely to be more than that, and that would be, in a sense, um, providing mowing in areas that are controlled. It would not be in the wetlands. Um, it wouldn't be in the prairies. The prairies are actually, the clients have a strong interest in the prairies. They're interested in native plants, and they want to sort of see and actually try to increase the size of the, the prairie that's out there and help restore it, that part of the environment. We'll be adding uh, strawberries um, also in the project. The tractor, um, um, the tractor is a CAD skimbal that I downloaded very quickly offline. Uh, what they use are, is just a mower, not the, the small mower, but something that will cut through the pampas grass. If they didn't mow, that would be a meadow of pampas grass and scotch uh, broom. You know, invasive species would be moving in. The mowing also happens for fire prevention. That's sort of with regulations and all the issues that we deal with that are all relevant and extremely important, but you are dealing with sort of mowing and fire and invasive species. So the, the tractor is, it's just a mower, um, um, and it's the fastest way to cut, th uh, cut through the um, pampas grass. You just mow over and they back up over it to eliminate it. And it's, you know, with the mowing, it actually does make a difference. And um, um, Jeff Schmick had made a comment that the, the prairie, the coastal prairie, um, and that's um, up here, coastal prairie. That area is the coastal prairie, and that has actually grows with the uh, with the mowing. Um, there uh, horses were there before. I do have an image of the site uh, from 05 of the horse, if uh, if you'd like to see that. Um, and then the um, I'll do I'll go through these items and I'll come back with the photo. Um, the barn does have a full bath. The one of the mower operators has a severe poison oak uh, allergy. And so there is a request to be able to clean and um, uh, um, uh, uh, take change clothing and be able to wash so it doesn't get into cars or other places. And it's just and same with the chickens. The the um, it's better to just for hygiene to have a uh, a, a bath that has it's dirtier so people can change. Um, 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 away from the main house, it is uh, uh, it's not eight thousand acres. And then the, the buffer sort of went and talked about, you know, we are respecting the, the wetland. Um, we are no intent of causing any harms. We're driving around it, you know, um, to avoid it. Um, but there are, there, uh, there are issues, like any project, there are multiple issues. And is this really sort of, um, um, is this the one that is really sort of, uh, you know, how relevant is that particular issue? Like how important is it is a question we have. I'll show you um, the uh, image of the, the horses. Uh, no, that's, that's fine. That was just uh, yeah, something that I read. Pardon me? It's nearly 15 minutes. Right, okay. Almost, okay. And I also, if there are, uh, I have images from what that area looks like from the, um, the aerial photos from 72, 87, you know, just get a sense of what that land looked like uh, in terms of wetlands and or the lack of wetlands. If you, uh, I could post or bring this around if it's helpful. Is anybody interested in seeing those? Pictures? No, th thank you. It's available thank online you. as public records. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, just uh, one question. I see two structures here, two of these black. Spots, what are those uh, uh, on this drawing? Yes. This constraints map is a, uh, the constraints map is an earlier version. So one is the main house and the other is an earlier iteration of the barn. barn. There was a wraparound porch and that was hiding the water tanks. We had the, the plastic water tanks and there are quite a few of uh, 12. At that point, it's 12,000 gallons. It's now after the fires, it's a higher, but the Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, um, in, in the drawing, it doesn't show the, the garage, the detached garage, right? Because it only showed two, two, two constructions, but there's supposed to be three, right? This, Angela, um, or maybe. I think go to the other slide, please. That oh. Yeah, this is, it's. Yeah, there you go. So the reason I shared the map with you, as, as uh, Mr. Manick mentioned, so that what you were seeing, the two blocks, are older versions, but I felt like it was helpful to share with you because it showed 
all of the delineated um, resources and their buffer zones. So um, it's, it's not what's proposed, what you see here are the actual proposed structures, but again, I felt like it was a good resource to help you kind of understand um, where things were and what the required buffer zone um, is in relationship to the development area. Questions. Commissioner Ketcher? I'm not sure who this question is for. The uh, There's mention in, about a condition for the ag easement over the rest of the parcel. Um, is that specifically the area outside the tan that's going to have, and what would this ag easement be? Um, and so I'm going back a little further. At the time of this parcel's creation, um, it was determined that an agricultural easement should be recorded um, over this parcel, subtracting uh, the area, uh, allowing for an area development, and then everything else should be um, dedicated as an agricultural easement. Unfortunately, that did not happen at the time of that subdivision's recordation. Um, so we're addressing that requirement now. Um, you are correct. It would be everything that's sort of outside of the delineated area would be covered by that agricultural easement. And we carried forward the language that was included in that 2000 approval of the subdivision. So the, um, well, it is a little concerning that it didn't get recorded. Hopefully now we have a better process to make sure those things get recorded. But um, as far and also presumably in, at that time, these sensitive uh, habitats or the plants, the coastal prairie, where they weren't aware of that. And so, uh, what what are our options now to um, make sure those are protected? If it with this ag easement, what? Um, so I think we have an opportunity to specify what we want the easement to say. And I think we can refine the conditions if the concern is to make sure that the area within the easement um, is eligible for agricultural use, but only outside of the sensitive habitat areas and the buffers. I think we can specify that requirement in the conditions of approval. And what would be the options? This is just the area there with the coastal prairie, those two. Mm -hmm. um, is it enough to have a smaller buffer? I mean, like if you're just having pasture, which is what it was, um, this was suitable for grazing was the recommendation. Uh, it would seem that uh, such as the fence at Fitzgerald Marine Reserve around the coastal prairie, you would just need to keep the grazing animals off the, uh, I mean, I don't know. I mean, they even have, they even say now with the nitrogen coming off the freeway that grazing is helpful for coastal prairie. But of course, yes, not, I, I've not heard that as well um, for, for grazing purposes and also to disturb the soil in a manner that allows the seeds to proceed. So th I think that, that is a good question. Um, I think the recommendation to require the agricultural easement didn't have any restrictions, specific restrictions on agricultural use, because we didn't think that there was a scenario within which an, an intensive agricultural use could be developed and sustained on the site. So given that it's a, a small site with very limited agricultural potential, the agricultural easement would, in effect, act as uh, protection of the resources because it wouldn't allow for any development other than agriculture. And then um, any agriculture that's likely to occur on the site is uh, in our view, likely to be low scale and wouldn't impact those resources. But that is hard to predict. Um, it's hard to know what a future owner might want to do, agriculturally speaking. Um, so while grazing might be good, if somebody wanted to put in planter beds and do a big row crop, we certainly wouldn't want that to occur, you know, within the footprint of where, let's say, the existing strawberry is. So I, I think that we have an opportunity to be a little bit more specific about the types of agricultural uses that could occur within the um, sensitive habitat areas, but it's something that we need to work on the language uh, to provide. 
So this hasn't come up before. Not to my knowledge. And so, uh, I'm, sorry. Angela, did you want to comment on that? I mean, how many square feet of coastal prairie are we talking about here? I mean, um, is this? It's in the biological report. It's an item that Jeff Schmick has identified the total, okay. and addresses in the uh, the WRA. Um, I'm just a ballpark number. I'm just wondering whether it was worth. Um, it looks like it's about the size. One is the size of the barn, and the other one uh, for the the barn structure. Um, it looks like two areas the size of that. I think they're shown better on the constraints map. If you go back to that one, this is a, it's, I think it's before this one. The constraints map. Yeah. yeah. So I believe the what this map is showing is that the um, coastal prairie is in the. Um, red blobs on the upper right yeah. and then the um and then the, you see the concentric circles which are the 50 foot and 100 foot buffers from those so the coastal prairie um is limited to those two red areas and then um the other three points are where the beach strawberry are right and the strawberries here a wetland here well, that's inside the development area, so it's not a concern. But the ag easement, it, I'm just thinking that if we try and, um, I mean, it seems with all this effort to protect these areas that, that we should consider this, but I'm just concerned that if we try and do this numerically about protecting, that it might be detrimental in itself. So I'm if sort could, of mixed feelings about which way to go with that. If I could add to yours. I went and talked to somebody at Jasper Ridge um, Biological Preserve, and this area was originally, you know, treeless, and it was all coastal prairie. What kept it coastal prairie was the elk, not the deer, not cattle ra later replaced the elk, and they did the same function. And without that, it will continue to disappear over time if it doesn't continuously being grazed by the same conditions that the elk provided. You know, if you put goats in there, they'll, they'll eat it all the way down to it's non-existent. If you expect deer to do it, that's not going to happen because that's not what they eat. And so, you know, if it's the idea is to preserve it, we, there is a grazing function that has to be continued, whether it's mechanical or livestock and of course you need the nutrients of the livestock to go with it so but that if you do do let's say the biological grazing of it you also start expanding it so I'm, after this discussion i'm inclined to yeah, just that's, let just, that um, this gets to be messy real quick yeah i i think the ag easement is a good thing we leave that my second question is um and i don't know once again who this comes to Pampas grass has been mentioned several times, and I know the LCP has provision for um, controlling that, and if, if that's related to attaching it to a development permit, it would seem this would be an opportunity to require that uh, eradication of the Pampas grass on the parcel. Is that, could that I, I don't disagree with that statement, and it sounds to me like the intent of the future owner is to mow and try and control it, so um, I think it would now would be an acceptable time to add a condition requiring um, the barn's design for it. Yes, they will yeah. be mo uh, removing the pampas grass. Thank you. Sure. Do I still have time to make a quick comment? Do I still have time? Are commissioners done yeah, with I their questions? So. Go ahead. Um, a short comment. Uh, uh, one just quick is uh, Mark Stegmeyer is a contractor here. That's just like the, I mean, we've been working in terms of sort of the detailing in terms of how sort of these ideas. I just want to think that he's here and he lives in Monterey. He can walk home from this project. The other is uh, regarding the building heights. The barn at the low point has an eight foot plate or so. It goes up at a slow slope. There's then the roof slope that uh, there is a vertical wall for the flashing. And then we have a roof that matches the uh, the slope of the house, and that's how we derived the uh, the the height of the barn. I mean, it was just start at one end and work our way up, and that's what we have. Um, then uh, the there's also in terms of the garage, there is the clearance for the garage door. There's my seismic system that 
is preventing property damage, and then we have a roof slope that matches the main house. So it's there is, it's just very both are very simple practical buildings that we want to keep cost down. And um, there was a comment from a public uh, from us uh, in in our correspondence that uh, the height of the barn is too high. Uh, what is the reason for, like, what is the, how is the barn going to be used that it needs to be so tall? God. I have a uh, eight-foot wall. Uh, right, please speak can, in the mic. Right. We can pass this and... Uh, and then I assume this is the barn, right? Picture of the barn. Okay. The the barn we have a at the low end up slope we have a standard eight foot wall. We have a low slope barn roof that goes up to the center portion. We have enough room for roof flashing, a bit of space, and then flashing um, up underneath the eave, and then we have the eave for the upper main portion, and that roof slope matches the main building, and that's how we derive the height of the barn. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. So during design review, uh, we were asked to reduce the height. I think, going from memory, I believe it was three feet we were saying that you know, we were within our requirements, and then um, during design review, it was proposed that we split the difference and reduce it by 18 inches, and to sort of make the issue go away, we're happy with that. So we reduced the pad by a foot, so we pushed the building into the ground by a foot and then dropped it by six inches. So the one comment that we reduced it by six inches is absolutely not true. You know, it's a distortion of what we were doing. And on one of those sheets, we do have notes, which are in public record right now, of what we were doing of dropping the height by uh, 18 inches. And then we've also noted on the drawings that we've gone from a building elevation, a previous one, to a lower one. And so we have made a, a already in design review, which was a long time ago, we made a, a you know, an effort to compromise. You know, it's, it's a little bit disappointing that we're having to sort of come back to this again. You know, the neighbors, I have not been contacted of the letters that you've received. None of those people have contacted me, my office, uh, my voicemail uh, goes to email. I have a digital phone, so every single phone call coming in is recorded, I mean, in terms of what's coming in. So I, I know who's been calling me and who hasn't. Um, and we would have been happy, especially like with the issues of the wetland, been more than happy to talk about what, what's going out there. I would have been more than happy to drive out there and meet with somebody to show the issues of a wetland. And the neighbors are complaining, I've been out there and they see me. They, they have not raised any of these two. They know who I am and they haven't raised these to me. It, it's a little Thank bit- you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Manning. Uh, please take a seat. Thank you. Uh, we have one more speaker. Uh, Mr. Stegmaier, you'll have five minutes. Hello, I'm Mark Stegmaier, contractor, and I just wanted to um, say I'm in support of this project. I also, that clip is gone, but I was part of the original subdivision 20 years ago on this and built one of the first houses that were there. The, in, the uh, two people were tenants in common. Uh, one of the persons that is complaining has been rather rough on Mr. Manick, um, was also delayed our project for years and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Even though he was part of the project, he, anyway. I think that building a house like this guarantees that you're gonna have a good land steward to take care of it and um, not have 40 horses out there or anything like that. And, your idea of, of talking about the elk might be an interesting thing. They do that a lot in Colorado as well. They have domestic elk to help restore the property. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's all so I have. That's all. Mm -hmm. So at this time, we would like to close the public hearing. Do I have a motion? Motion to close. Second. So, 
All those in favor? Aye. 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 So public hearing is closed. Commissioners have discussion. I like have a quick question. Go ahead. Uh, for the architect, is um, I noticed there's in the picture is pampas grass. Is the pampas grass going to be removed? Um, yes, with the mowing. So it is the uh, family members that get together. Right now, the the mowers are trucked in. There's no place to keep them. So it's renting a mower, putting on a flatbed, driving it out, and then um, the mowing. attempt is to remove the pampas grass. Yes, absolutely. Okay. it's beautiful without it. the The client likes the the site without pampas grass. She's not a fan of pampas grass. And there was a suggestion that we add a condition for re uh, requiring removal of the pampas grass, which staff is in support of. Excellent. Um, just a general comment, since we're in a discussion phase. I do like the design. I think this is a high quality design. And I have no problem with the heights. Just to be, I find they're in proportion. I would expect for a barn to look. I, I find it very representative of a barn and well designed. Commissioner Ketchum. Uh, yeah, about the condition of approval for the Pampas slash Jabata grass, I just wanted to uh, say that's for eradication on the parcel and that mowing doesn't cut it, shall we say. Um, it needs to be dug out or treated with so thank you Commissioner Santa Cruz do uh, you have any com last minute comments no no I thank you yeah, I just ready to make that call so should if we move on the screen the planning commission the decision so the project looks good to me and uh, I think a lot of work has gone in there. Uh, I just wanted to make sure we address the correspondence here. Um, it's in an area, uh, a, a good, uh, good uh, location was chosen so that it's not obtrusive of the scenic uh, beauty of the area. So I'm fine with it. Um, do I have a motion? Should yeah. I read the motion? Okay, that the Planning Commission adopt the initial study and mitigate a negative declaration and approve the plan agricultural district permit, coastal development permit, design review permit, and grading permit, county file PLN 2010-00079 by making the required finding and adopting condition of approval as listed in attachment A. And that includes Pampas grass removal. That the motion maker would need to agree to. Uh, there it had been suggested that in a condition of approval be added requiring the eradication of pampas and jubata grass on the site. And would you like to make that a part of your motion? So, so be it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Second. Already second. All those in favor, aye. say aye. 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 Any one who opposes? Nope. No. So the motion is carried four to zero. Uh, congratulations. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think uh, that brings us on to correspondence. Uh, in addition to the correspondence that uh, we've discussed today, uh, Janet has provided you with um, a package of uh, letters regarding, no? Oh, for me. I'll provide it after the oh, meeting. thank um, you. Yeah. Um, so we have received a number of letters with regard to the Canyon Lane project uh, where uh, we had an informational presentation at our last meeting and so uh, there continues to be concerns about that and we will provide you with copies of that correspondence. The other piece of correspondence we received regarding the Canyon Lane project was an invitation from the uh, person who manages the Emerald Lake dam to visit the site. Um, we would be happy to put him in touch with you individually or what I would like to suggest if it works for the commissioners is um, 
that we arranged to go together um, at um, prior to the hearing on the um, application coming to you. So um, we will. Uh, I, the, the thing we'll need to be uh, we'll need to think about is it will need to be noticed. Having all you together constitutes a meeting. So um, at, I think maybe what we'll do is on an afternoon following the planning commission hearing, take a trip up to visit the site at, uh, on a date that works for you. Okay. Is that uh, do we know idea? when it's coming up to, uh, to the, it's, to the um, commission? No, it's unlikely to come anytime soon. So I think we're, we've got um, quite a few I, months I, before. I'm open to the idea of going, to, uh, going as a group. Okay. Uh, well, I'll, I would uh, attempt to make those arrangements, and if for some reason we are unable to do that, then you can uh, take him up on his offer as individuals. Okay, okay so um, the other pieces of correspondence that have been trickling in have been uh, regarding the Gray Whale Cove project, and you'll be getting copies of that, which is, segues me into uh, the next meeting. We do not have a study session planned. In fact, the November 27th meeting, given its proximity to Thanksgiving, has been canceled. Um, our next meeting will be on December 11th. 11th thank you. And um, at that meeting, we will have the Gray Whale Cove um, pedestrian crossing CDP. Um, and we will have um, the Pillar Point RV Park project, which is um, another uh, controversial project where I expect we'll have a number of speakers. Um, we'll also have a general plan conformity on the consent calendar. So that uh, brings us to the director's report. Um, since I've been keeping you up to speed on our comments on Stanford's development plan, um, you've probably seen that they withdrew their application from Santa Clara County. Um, nevertheless, um, I think uh, our, we continue to have concerns regarding future development there, and we'll be keeping track of uh, any future proposals. And then something that uh, positive that came out from our discussions with Santa Clara County on this was um, one of the supervisors asked staff to come back with um, an assessment of the possibility of creating a memorandum of understanding or other agreement with surrounding jurisdictions about how when large projects that impact multiple jurisdictions, um, how the mitigation measures will be distributed amongst the impacted jurisdictions. So um, I think that will be a fruitful discussion, and um, I'll keep you updated on how that goes. Um, also, um, Joe LeClaire is working feverishly right now trying to complete the public review draft of Connect the Coast Side that responds to all the comments uh, that we received from the Technical Advisory uh, Committee. And so um, that should be released next week, if not by the end of this week. And uh, it will be scheduled for uh, information item before the Planning Commission in the near future. Um, the final thing I'll mention is uh, uh, earlier in today's hearing uh, regarding the Purissima Cemetery, uh, there was a question asked about how to resolve disputes regarding permit requirements, and I mentioned that the Coastal Commission has a procedure for doing so. And in fact, the Coastal Commission meeting is occurring right now as we speak in um, at the Oceano Hotel in uh uh, pillar point and one of the items on the agenda is w w with regard to a dispute as to whether or not a project that was determined to be exempt from coastal permit requirements should require a coastal development permit and it had to do with the presence of some willows on the site which the applicants biologist determined did not meet the LCP definition of a wetland or a riparian habitat. Um, and 
in the absence of a wetland or riparian habitat, the site is outside the Coastal Commission's appeal jurisdiction and excluded from permitting requirements. So um, the commission staff is recommending that um, the commission determine that a coastal permit should be obtained for the project. Um, and if that decision is made, then we, the applicant will need to submit the necessary materials and the matter will come before you. So I anticipate that will happen and um, you'll get more information about it when it comes to you on hearing. But we'll see what the commission does with that today. So that concludes my report. Thank you. Uh, so uh, go ahead, oh, Commissioner Ketchum. In the past, when the Coastal Commission has met here on the coast side, there's been some kind of a social event. Will that happen this year? You know, um, I s asked myself the same question and didn't have an opportunity to check the agenda. So I don't know the answer to that. If they are going to have a reception, generally they're open to the public, or um, if there's a cap on the number of people, there's they at least... Uh, give an opportunity for you to indicate to see if there's room. So I don't know. The place to find out would be to go to the Coastal Commission's meeting agenda for this week. Oh, so the county's not putting on. Oh, the county is not. Oh. Not that I'm aware of. I'd be surprised if <laughs> we were. But um, no, I'm not. Okay. The, I don't think the county is hosting any special events there. Any other questions for Steve? No. Okay. Um, any Comments from I just had one comment. Uh, uh, Janet, thank you for forwarding the Planning Commission training information. I did attend that. This was about transportation transformation. Uh, so my and there was a lot of information provided. So my question is: uh, Is San Mateo County working on any of those? Uh, transportation transformation to ease the uh, traffic and uh, other concerns? Yes, um, absolutely. So um, Home for All is an initiative by the county intended to address the housing crisis. And in conjunction with addressing the housing crisis, we understand that dealing with transportation and circuit problems is a crucial ingredient to the solution. So um, part of the Home for All effort includes um, a traffic and parking solutions work group, um, of which I am a co-lead of that work group. And uh, we, Home for All has gone through various iterations, and the establishment of this particular work group is somewhat recent. We've had one meeting to date, and we'll have another one coming up in a few weeks, where we're going to be talking about the types of products that we want to produce over the course of the next six months to the year. And a lot of it has to do with um, how we communicate with community members and jurisdictions on uh, transportation issues and solutions and how we can work together towards those solutions. Um, and then when it comes to communicating and working with the community to solve these problems, we see the rollout of Connect the Coast Side as an opportunity for us to kind of um, test, if you will, the methods by which we try and advance some of the transportation solutions that we think are needed to support housing. So uh, we are closely involved with the process, and we are trying to integrate some of the uh, new concepts and ideas that are coming out of these efforts into our Connect the Coastside project. Steve, on a different note, is the December meeting the only meeting we have? That is correct. Then we should also have an agenda item for chair for January. Thank you for the reminder. How does that work? We at the end we propose, vote we propose for a chair to succeed. And, and okay, or so continue. we you do we now. vote? No, no. <laughs> so so we vote at that time, or do we wait till January for that? We submit nominations and vote at the end usually. Okay. 
we could do it any time. Yes, yeah, so I think maybe last year we were a little bit late in the year when it happened. But why yeah, I'm the benefit of doing it in December is that we start off the year with a new chair in place. So Perfect. we will put that on the okay. agenda. Thank you. So with the commissioner's permission, we adjourn the meeting. Thank you. No wonder his project's taken 10 years. Whoa.